Really this pleased conference will now be recorded. Very pleased to have Dr. Philippe Strout, our consultant in biosafety from ZBIOS in Belgium, joining us today. Dr. Philippe is no stranger to the Pakistan Biological Safety Association or to Pakistan. He has uh, developed a number of workshops and given them on biosafety cabinets, institutional biosafety committees, uh, as well as on um, now webinars on masks. Uh, he has worked with PEPSA since 2011. And we're very glad to have Dr. Mashal doing the main point, summary points. Dr. Mashal is a medical doctor and she also has a master's in public health from Australia. So with that, uh, please, I'd like to say one or two things. The chat room will be open for questions and there will be a section for questions after each section in this presentation. So please go ahead and use the chat room for that. And uh, now with no further ado, thank you, Dr. Philippe, and please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Rizibat, thank you, Dr. Marshall. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. It's my pleasure to present you this, uh, this first session on, uh, on issues related to mask and, and mask shortage. Actually, this session is really to bring uh, a number of information uh, about, about the risks related to coronavirus and the mask in order to facilitate the second session, which will be more based on questions and, and, and uh, discussion. So what I, uh, I plan to present you today is first some information about SARS coronavirus 2 and COVID. Um, actually, I will focus on a few aspects which are interesting when we speak about masks. Then I will also present an, a second section on aerosols and aerosol transmission. Those who followed the training on biosafety cabinet already had uh, part of that information. And then the last section of today will be on, on the face mask, face mask themselves, presenting the different types. Uh, and also uh, the way they, they work and what uh, against what they protect. There will be at the end a very last slide about the topics for the next sessions. Um, so, um, so this first part on SARS coronavirus and COVID. Uh, what is the difference between the two? Actually, when we speak about COVID-19, we speak about the, uh, the disease, the coronavirus disease, uh, which was uh, which arose in uh, 2019. While when we speak about SARS-CoV-2, in that case, we speak about the virus that causes uh, coronavirus disease. SARS means uh, severe acute uh, respiratory syndrome, and we've already heard about that uh, that word uh, a number of years ago when there was the first uh, outbreak of SARS. So there are a number of different coronavirus infections. Actually, there are coronavirus strains which have been in with human for quite a long time, and they are actually uh, the cause of a common cold. So it's not a major uh, medical issue, I would say. But then there are, lately there are three different uh, infections caused by some more virulent and more uh, dangerous uh, SARS coronavirus, uh, coronaviruses. The first one was SARS-CoV, uh, and it was an outbreak in Asia in 2002-2003, and it finished in 2004. It was it's, it started from China and, and Southeast Asia, but then expanded worldwide, but without really causing a, a, a pandemic. Then uh, some years ago in 2012, uh, there was another outbreak in Middle East about uh, caused by MERS coronavirus. This one is, uh, is more, more dangerous. It creates a more severe disease. It's still, it's still in the air, so there are still people becoming uh, sick with this uh, infection, but uh, it, it never expanded into a pandemic. And then the last one, the one which is causing the current uh, pandemic. If we compare the two corona, uh, SARS coronavirus, so the one from now and the one from uh, 2002 to 2004, there are uh, a number of similarities. First, the genetic material is very much similar. So 79% of the genetic material uh, is identical. 
Uh, there are also a number of similarities with respect to disease and epidemiology. First, they have, uh, the two viruses have a common origin. They come from bats with some, probably some intermediate uh, mammals. They are both responsible for respiratory diseases, even if uh, SARS-CoV-2 is also responsible for other symptoms. And they are both likely to lead to severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS. Uh, and this disease, when, uh, when it really develops, is likely to require oxygen supply, but also, uh, some, in some cases, artificial ventilation. Both viruses have a similar viability, so they survive more or less the same way and resistance patterns. And finally, the two uh, have the same high risk groups, so mainly older people and people with a poor health status, mainly people who have some uh, res uh, respiratory disease or uh, circulatory disease, so with uh, the blood system. So quite a lot of similarities, but so why the first one was not did not develop into a pandemic and this one does? Actually, there are a number of, of differences which, which can explain this. So the first coronavirus uh, produced a more severe disease with higher mortality rates. It was around 10% when in this case it's, uh, it's no more or less considered to 3%, but since we don't have a, a, a really serology of the population, it's probably much lower. So since the, the disease was more severe with high mortality, it was, uh, it was less easy for the virus to transmit. Each time someone dies because of the virus, it's a kind of end for the virus also, because we can take precautions with the, with the body and so on. So it's a, in some way, it, uh, it, expand, it limits its uh, dissemination. Then the new coronavirus also have, uh, seems to have a higher receptor affinity in human cells. So it, it is able to colonize human cells in a more efficient way. So it's more virulent. And colonization of cells starts with the uh, nose and, and, and throat. Also, uh, one point which is important is that it appears that there is some virus shedding before the onset of symptoms, like uh, up to 24 hours before we see the first symptoms. And there is also the possibility of uh, virus shedding uh, in asymptomatic cases or very mild cases. That means that people who don't have any obvious symptoms of, of respiratory disease already disseminate the virus. Of course, this makes the prevention much more difficult. A third point is that uh, the virus load in the nose and throat uh, appears, the highest load appears immediately after the onset of the symptoms, while it was much later with SARS coronavirus 1. Again, this, this makes it much more transmissible. It, when the symptoms are there, immediately there is already some, trans, uh, some transmission. Then the last point is that uh, the symptoms are much more uh, diverse in the second coronavirus. So it's less easy to recognize the virus. So some, some people, for instance, that have mostly uh, uh, some intestinal problems, something which has, doesn't have anything to do with uh, respiratory disease. In that case, of course, it's more, much more difficult to identify COVID. So now about the viability of uh, sars coronavirus 2 it, as, as I said before, it's apparently more or less similar to the first coronavirus. And there, there has been already some studies on the, the second one, and for instance, one study shows that uh, the virus still uh, is still present after more than three hours in aerosols, up to 70 hours on stainless steel or plastic, 24 hours on cardboard and four hours on, co on copper. This seems to be quite long. And if think, we think about the 70 hours on stainless steel and plastic, it's, it's very long. Still, we must uh, take uh, uh, look at, at, uh, at the way uh, a, a virus disappears in, in nature. If you look at the graph on the, uh, on the bottom there, the, the, the one on the left-hand side, you see that uh, we have the decrease of the virus with time. The x-axis is time, and this is the uh, concentration of the virus. But it, it's a logarithmic scale. So this is 1, 100, 1,000, 10,000, yeah, uh, 1, 10, sorry, oh, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. If we 
translate this logarithm scale into a normal scale, you have a decrease of the virus like this. This means that the virus uh, dies very quickly by itself during the first hours. And then after that, the decrease is more slowly. And you still have some virus present after quite a long time. But the quantity of the virus here can still be detected, but it's not likely to still cause infection or much less likely. So most of the, the time where we can get infected is in the early phase of, of the virus. After that, it dies and the concentration gets lower and we get at, to a point that it's not uh, infectious anymore. Of course, it's a new virus and we don't have uh, the infectious dose yet. The infectious dose is the quantity of virus which is uh, sufficient to cause infection. That's the data that we still don't have. A good, thing about, a good news about this uh, coronavirus, it's, it's first uh, susceptibility to most physical and chemical factors is quite classical and also it's a quite sensitive virus. It's not highly resistant, I would say. So the virus is sensitive to UV light, to heat, so autoclaving, for instance, uh, is efficient, to desiccation, uh, it's in aerosol droplets, but if the aerosol droplet dries, in that case, the virus will die. Sensitive to alcohol, 70% alcohol, and the different types of solution or gel that contain at least 60% of, of alcohol. Bleach, acetic acid, hydrogen peroxide, and also water and soap. This means that hand washing is a good way to get rid of the virus. Uh, and, and that, of course, is very important with respect to, uh, to our own protection and to uh, also to place barriers to, uh, to dis dissemination. W washing hands is very, very important. So about the transmission of sars coronavirus 2 clearly the transmission is, uh, is done through airborne droplets, uh, aerosols. I will explain a little bit more about that in, in a few minutes. From, from those, uh, that information, which is that's something which is quite clear, uh, there are three main transmission modes that appear uh, more based on, on epidemiological evidence, the way it, it, different people get infected. And these are in order. The first one is direct or close contact. So people re re really live close to together uh, the, in the same household, like couples and so on, uh, children and parents and so on. In that case, they have close contacts. That's the main mode of transmission. Then there is exposure to contaminated surface. Even if it, the virus uh, spreads to airborne droplets, those droplets will finally uh, hit some, uh, some surfaces that will contaminate hands, uh, desks, uh, uh, different objects, and so on. And if it touch those objects, of course, we can then um, get infected, if, for instance, if we touch our nose or, or mouth and so on. This is why it's very important to hash, uh, wash hands. And the third uh, transmission mode is uh, real exposure to aerosol at a distance. So those aerosols are likely to stay in the air for quite a long time and travel with the, and travel during that time. And this is uh, uh, the third way of, of transmission. And I will explain a little bit more. <laughs> Uh, someone is not on mute there. Okay, so uh, in direct relation with those three main transmission modes, the main prevention means are uh, physical distance. So keep, keeping some physical distance is very important. Uh, depending on the uh, country or region of the world, we speak about 1.5 meter or two meters. Then cleaning and disinfection. Uh, I told you that the coronavirus is uh, sensitive to most disinfectant. Cleaning is also important because it's also sens sensitive to uh, soap and water. And then the third prevention means, in addition to the, 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 the other, is the wearing of masks. And that's what we'll explore uh, further now. Uh, of course, masks will depend about if we are really uh, exposed to very high concentration of virus, high risk situation, or other situations. Okay. And I think it's time for questions, but uh, Dr. Marshall will not uh, will now uh, summarize what I said in uh, in Urdu for your facility. So, Dr. Marshall. So, yes, 
इस सेशन में हमने सबसे पहले देखा कि सार्स हमने कोविड 19 की डेफिनेशन देखी कोविड 19 वो बीमारी है और उसका पॉजिटिव एजेंट सार्स कोव टू है सार्स वायरसेस पहले भी आई हुई है डिफरेंट उनको डिफरेंट नेम्स दिया था सार्स जो पहले आई थी वो 2002 में 2000 एंड 2004 तक थी एशिया में आउटब्रेक हुआ था फिर उसके बाद मर्स आई थी जो अभी तक कंटिन्यूड है वो टू में एंड अब 2019 दिसंबर में स्टार्ट हुआ है कोविड uh, 19 एंड इसका पोटेंशियल एक पेंडेमिक पे पहुंच चुका है इसकी पिछली वायरसेस uh, से कुछ सिमिलैरिटीज थी फॉर एग्जांपल ओरिजिन कॉमन हो सकता है बैट्स पोटेंशियली बैट से ओरिजिन हुआ था ये लोग कॉज करते हैं रेस्पिरेटरी सिम्टम्स एंड uh, जो जिनको अटैक करते हैं जो लोग ज्यादा वनरेबल हैं इसमें भी वो सेम हाई रिस्क ग्रुप्स भी सेम है फॉर एग्जाम्पल uh, लोग जो बुढ़ापे में हों या फिर जिन के पास पहले से कोई बीमारियां और उनकी सेहत बिल्कुल ठीक ना हो सार्स कोव टू एंड जिसने कोविड नाइनटीन कॉज किया है एंड पिछले सार्स वायरसेस में कुछ डिफरेंसेस भी हैं फॉर एग्जांपल कोविड नाइनटीन इज ज्यादा वेरलेंट है ह्यूमंस के सेल्स को ज्यादा स्ट्रांगली अटैक करती है इसके अंदर ट्रांसमिशन भी हिडन है लाइक वायरस शेडिंग सिम्टम्स शुरू होने से पहले स्टार्ट हो जाती है इसलिए ये वायरस इतनी तेजी से फैल भी रही है और इसके जो सिम्टम्स भी हैं वो भी ज्यादा वैरायटी पे हैं फॉर एग्जांपल अपर एस्पिरेटरी सिम्टम्स के अलावा डायरिया वगैरह के साथ भी ये प्रेजेंट कर सकती है वायबिलिटी uh, इसकी डिफरेंट सर्फिस पे डिफरेंट डिफरेंट सर्फिस पे वो डिफरेंट अमाउंट ऑफ टाइम के लिए उसके ऊपर रहेगी फॉर एग्जाम्पल एरोसल्स के अंदर वो तीन घंटों तक रह सकती है एरोसल फॉर्म में अगर वो स्टेनलेस स्टील या प्लास्टिक के ऊपर हो तो वो तीन दिन तक रह सकती है और सेवेंटी टू आवर्स कार्डबोर्ड वगैरह पे वो ट्वेंटी फोर आवर्स या एक दिन तक रह सकती है एंड कॉपर पे वो चार घंटों तक रह सकती है लेकिन एक बात इस पर नोट करना बहुत जरूरी है कि जितनी देर वो एनवायरमेंट में रहेगी उतनी उसकी पोटेंसी और कम होती जाएगी यानी कि जितना रिस्क है उससे इन्फेक्ट होने का वो कम होता जाएगा Uh, ये वायरस काफी सेंसिटिव है विच इज गुड न्यूज इसका मतलब ये है कि वो काफी चीजों से डिस्ट्रॉय हो सकती है फॉर एग्जाम्पल यूवी लाइट से हीट से अल्कोहल अगर हम 70 परसेंट यूज करें ब्लीच ऑक्सीजन पर ऑक्साइड एंड इवन सोप एंड हैंड वॉश सोप एंड वाटर से हैंड वॉशिंग से इसके अंदर जनरल रिकमेंडेशन यही है कि आप फ्रिक्शन प्रॉपर फ्रिक्शन से अपने हाथ वॉश करें और ट्वेंटी सेकेंड्स के लिए करें टू डिस्ट्रॉय द वायरस ट्रांसमिशन जो सार्स कोव कोविड नाइन्टीन का है या सार्स कोव टू का है वो प्राइमेरली थ्रू एयरबोर्न ड्रॉपलेट्स हो रहा है या एरोसल्स और इसके अंदर पे जो मोड्स होते हैं वो या तो आप डायरेक्ट uh, कांटेक्ट या क्लोज कांटेक्ट फॉर एग्जांपल आप किसी के साथ रहते हैं जिसको ये वायरस है दूसरा ये है अगर आप किसी कंटेमिनेटेड सर्फेस को हाथ लगाए और फिर uh, उससे भी हो सकती है अपने मुंह पे या कहीं आप हाथ लगा दें एंड तीसरा ये है कि अगर हवा में वो सस्पेंडेड रहे तो फिर रिमोट एट डिस्टेंस एक्सपोजर भी हो सकता है इसलिए इन मोड्स ऑफ ट्रांसमिशन को uh, नजर में रखते हुए भी इसके प्रिवेंशन के तीन एस्पेक्ट्स uh, हैं एक ये कि आप फिजिकल डिस्टेंस रखें लोगों के दरमियान दूसरा ये कि आप क्लीनिंग एंड डिसइंफेक्शन करें एंड तीसरा ये कि आप मास्क पहने इस सेशन में हम मास्क के ऊपर ज्यादा फोकस करेंगे और अब अगर आपके कोई क्वेश्चन है डॉक्टर जीबा डॉक्टर जीबा विल यू डू द क्यू एन ए नाउ Okay, I might uh, want. Uh, I will try to answer the question I see on the on the chat link. Uh, first, there is one participant uh, who is asking about survival of the virus on uh, on fruits and, and vegetables. I would say that, uh, to my knowledge, it has not been tested, but it's likely that the virus will survive some time on 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 food, on any type of food item, uh, and, and also. One of the reasons for the virus to disappear is 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 drying. In the if it if it's a case in on, on some food, it will stay there for a while. But don't forget that uh, that kind of of curve where the the dying of the virus is very uh, very steep at first, and then it uh, it, it it slows down. So during the first hours, most of the virus gets inactivated. But still, there is a risk of of having some fruits and 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 vegetables and so on 
uh, contaminated and, and, and uh, creating infection. So again, washing uh, fruits and vegetables and so on is something which is very important with respect to protection. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, yeah, I'm Zibar. sorry, my I was uh, my microphone was stuck. Um, we have a question about whether or not the virus is aerosolized. He says uh, medical procedures do produce aerosols, uh, but coughing and sneezing also do. Do they produce aerosols or droplets? If you say aerosols, then it's much more dangerous. Even if the infected person coughs or sneezes and leaves the place, the other person can get infected within three hours. What do you say? Okay, uh, I think that uh, this question might, uh, might, I mean, the answer might appear during the, the, the next section. So I will not answer right now. If it's still there after that uh, section, please ask ask again. And there's um, another question about another virus along with COVID-19 causing almost the same symptoms with 95% similarity and that it's speculated that this has been around since October. I think we don't want to be addressing this question on this particular topic. The other question is, Is there are there any uh, studies on the viability of COVID-19 on surfaces of silver? Not to my knowledge. But I think that with respect to surface, when we see the study that uh, has already been done on that, there are quite a big difference between the different surfaces. And so we need to be very careful with this because we, if it, as long as it's not tested, uh, all kind of type of surfaces are likely to be contaminated. So uh, that's why it's very important to disinfect surfaces. And it's true in a laboratory setting, in a hospital setting, it's also true in our normal life. Uh, and so disinfection is important, but also uh, washing with things. So, then the last question is, is Dettol useful? Is what? Dettol, D-E-T-T-O-L. Yeah, uh, Dettol is, uh, is made of alcohol. Uh, I don't know exactly the percentage, but it's likely to, have, to, be, to be efficient. It is efficient uh, against quite a lot of our microorganisms, including other viruses that are also sensitive to alcohol. So I would expect yes, but I don't know any specific study on this. Okay. Uh, one question on the animal that was the main source of NCOV transmission. Yeah, what we know is that there are many coronaviruses, including the, the two SARS coronavirus, which are present in bats. So we think that the original reservoir is bats. Uh, still, there, are quite, there is quite a lot of discussion about the intermediate. So for SARS coronavirus 1, it could have been civets. In this case, we spoke about pangolin, but it's not so, it's not so sure actually. So it's likely that between the bats and human, there has been some other, some intermediate animals, but uh, I, I would say it's not totally sure which one they, they are. There's a question about transmission from animals to humans. At the current day with SARS coronavirus 2, um, I, I don't know. It has been trans, uh, transmitted already from animals to humans. Uh, the question is probably more, uh, is, can it be transmitted to animals that live close to us? Uh, there, are, there has been a few cases of infection in, in cats or even in a tiger in, in, in New York. So uh, if, it, if it can be transmitted to cats, in that case, it, it could then uh, go back. Uh, cats could also infect, infect people. But apparently, uh, those, the few cases, uh, first, there are isolated cases. So it's not obvious that uh, it, uh, it's a good transmission. And also there are questions about is it real or is it false positive or, or things like that. So it's not well established yet, but there could be a risk with some animals. Another question about uh, 
how we use paper in many stages from the registration of a patient till the form is transported to the laboratory, can paper be a source from which you can get the virus? Uh, yes, paper can be a source, uh, and there is no specific study yet, except the one I mentioned. They they did it. Uh, they did some uh, uh, contamination and then measurements on on carpo, uh, and the, trend, uh, the duration of uh, the viability was quite low. But uh, but still, if for instance, if a paper is is recently contaminated, in that case, if you transmit that paper, uh, somewhat someone could be contaminated with that. But uh, I don't have the slide under my, my eyes, but it's a quite short survival. Uh, so paper, we could, for in, if we need to, to get some paper out of the lab, for instance, we could let them there. And if you cannot decontaminate them, uh, only get them out of the lab after some time. But paper could be a way. So there's a couple of questions, but I think we need to go on. Um, so can we go to the next session? We'll take some of these up later on. Yeah, and also there, there are questions that we'll discuss on the on, on the second session, so uh, next week. So I yeah, okay, let's move to the next session. So this section is on aerosols and aerosol transmission. So first, what are aerosols? Actually, aerosols are liquid droplets, uh, possibly solid particles that are suspended in the air. So that means that those droplets, particles, they are so fine that they can stay in the air for quite a long time. And actually aerosols are, are present everywhere. In the environment, for instance, the picture on the left-hand side is, uh, you see some clouds there. Clouds are aerosols. They are made of liquid droplets that can stay there for a very long time and they can move with the wind and so on. So this is typically an aerosol. The second picture is smoke. Smoke is also an aerosol, but mostly made of, of solid particles together with some, uh, some chemical molecules. And then it's present in nature, uh, but we also use aerosols for different purposes. For instance, if we need to administrate some, uh, some drug to someone who, who has asthma and want to, uh, the product to, to get into contact with the, uh, with the interior of the lungs, in that case, we can create an aerosol uh, to, to, to reach that. We can also use aerosols with some aerosol can to spray. We can also use aerosol to disseminate some uh, some molecules, for instance, in the atmosphere for some uh, spraying, for instance, disinfectant and so on. Then we. All the infection, uh, the infe uh, aerosols are not infectious, of course. They are infectious uh, infect uh, when they are, uh, when they contain some uh, some infectious agents. So uh, most of the time, in a lab, for instance, we use uh, we we culture we, we use agents which are in a liquid solution. Uh, and in that case, if we mix those solution, if we spill, uh, in that case, we create some liquid droplets and also some fine droplets that can stay in the air. And in that case, of course, those droplets can contain some, some biological agent. It's the case for coronavirus, but for most agents. Also, if, for instance, those small droplets dry out, in that case, uh, or naked bacteria that can also be uh, uh, make an aerosol. On this slide, you see the relationship between the size of the aerosol particles and the time uh, taken so that uh, the aerosol settles. And you see that the, for very big particles, uh, they will drop very easily and they will settle uh, very quickly in a few seconds. At the other end, if you see uh, very small aerosol particles, in that case, they will stay in the air for quite a long time, uh, more than 40 hours in this case. That means that they will stay there, uh, it, that, that experiment was done in still air, but if there, are some, if there is some wind, if there are some air flows, in that case, those aerosol particles will move together with the air and they might uh, travel some distance. 
uh, in most cases, when you generate an aerosol, you will have droplets of different sizes. And so that means that part of it will settle rapidly and part of it will, will, will be able to stay in the air and then move uh, depending on the air flows. So just remember that the largest one will settle very rapidly and uh, the smallest one are likely to stay for a very long time in, in the air. There was a question about coughing and sneezing uh, as source of a aerosol. Actually, uh, coughing and sneezing, uh, there are reactions of our organism uh, to get some rid of some discomfort. If, if it's itching and so on, in that case, we, we will cough or sneeze uh, to get rid of that, of that uh, discomfort. But it's also uh, a very good way, and that was used by bacteria, by viruses, uh, to spread and to disseminate in, in the air and to possibly uh, infect other people. And you see that on the picture there that uh, when, when coughing or sneezing like that, in that case, there is a, a kind of cloud of, made of, of aerosol droplets. The large one, the largest one with ones will uh, settle very quickly, but the fine one will stay in the air for quite a long time. These are real aerosols that can really move through air flows. So coughing and sneezing is, is, is a very uh, energetic uh, source of aerosol uh, dissemination. It's a very effective mode of dissemination also for the viruses uh, and, and for the bacteria. Why? Because there are some fine droplets that will be able to move and to contaminate other people, uh, object or uh, infect some people. However, uh, droplets uh, and, and those aerosols are also likely to be emitted when breathing, normally when exhaling, when breathing out, when talking and so on. But in that case, in a much more limited number and with much less energy. So there will be less very fine droplets that will stay a very long time in the air. So coughing and sneezing, they are very high uh, risk situation if someone is infected. Yes, I showed you this uh, this picture uh, to to really think about uh, how aerosols spread and what are the limitations. If we look at the at that graph, that picture, uh, actually, it's it's based on a model, and we see there that when coughing or sneezing, there are the big particles will settle very rapidly, while the, the smallest one will, will stay in the air for a longer time. And because of that, they will be able to reach longer distance. In this case, it shows, for instance, that the fine particles that will stay in the air for 12 hours and move almost 50 meters. If you think about that, it's really, it's, it, it's really frightening. We think, OK, someone is sneezing or, or coughing somewhere, and 50 meters away, there are still some aerosol which is potentially infectious and that could uh, infect people. Of course, we need to, to be careful with this. In practice, it's not really the case. Why? First, because when someone uh, is sneezing or coughing, there will be a cloud that is produced by, by sneezing or coughing. And that cloud will be very dense at the start, but then it will disseminate. And so there is a dilution. And so the particles that will be away, there will be only a very few particles. Most of the particles will, will spread in all directions. Also, remember uh, about the viability of the virus. The virus, there is a very a quite steep viral decay. So the virus is inactivated by itself at first. So that means that, so, for instance, liquid droplets that stay in the air for 12 hours, most of the virus will have disappeared when it's settled. So clearly, the highest the highest risk is is very close to the person who is coughing or sneezing. The longer the distance, the less risk there is because of dilution and because of the natural inactivation of the virus. So again, this stresses on the importance of of, of uh, some uh, physical distance, and of course, we can add a barrier to that, and that's that's why we use masks. So clearly aerosols are a major source of dissemination and transmission of SARS coronavirus 2, both in natural conditions, but also in healthcare and laboratory conditions. In natural conditions, if someone is infected and, and talks and so on, or even more if he if he's coughing or sneezing, but also in healthcare and laboratory conditions. 
in laboratory conditions, for instance, if you have some uh, some culture of the or even some samples or some cultures uh, of of the virus, and you you do some pipetting, you do some mixing, and so on, there is a risk of aerosol. And of or, and of course, if there is a spill, in the healthcare setting, taking care of patient, for instance, if you have to remove the the, the patient which is laying on the back and you want to to be lying uh, the other way, in that case, you have to handle it. And you, there, there will be an aerosol because that person is, is breathing. But it's even more the case if you have to do some intubation or if you have to remove a, a, a ventilator and so on. So there are clearly situations that are could be considered as high risk situations with respect to aerosol generation. And so there are uh, different ways to, to try to control aerosols. Uh, the first, uh, at the end of the slide, uh, the first series of measures are, are related to containment. Biosafety cabinets, this is really some, some, those are devices that have been developed on purpose to control aerosols. Of course, we can use biosafety cabinets in most laboratory situations, but not for uh, in a healthcare setting, for instance. In that case, you cannot work with a patient on a biosafety cabinet, of course. A second way to do it through containment is using a negative pressure and HEPA filtration. Okay? When such protection means are not available for different reasons, and for instance, in a healthcare setting, in that case, that's where we need to, to think about personal protective equipment, uh, which is mainly done uh, through the different type of masks that we can use. And that will be for the next session. So now it's time for, for questions again. So, Michelle. So, just quick summary is section key. Is section we have aerosols go discuss kia. Hamne sabse pehle dekha ki aerosols jo hote hain, wo kya hote hain? Wo koi bhi liquid ya solid particles hain jo hawa mein reh jate hain. Infectious aerosols wo hote hain ki wo particles jiske andar koi infectious agent present ho. Aerosol ka jo size hota hai, usse directly proportional hota hai, wo kitne door travel karega aur kitne deer wo hawa mein rahega. Jitna bada aerosol hoga, wo utne jaldi uh, settle kar jayega. Hamne phir dekha ki agar aap cough kare ya sneeze kare, to jo aerosol ka wo hota hai, usko energy mil jati hai aur wo zada door travel kar sakta hai. Isliye coughing and sneezing se agar infectious uh, jo aerosols hote hain aur agents hote hain, wo zada ja sakte hain aur ye ek bahut effective mode of uh, dissemination hota hai. Lekin isme uh, ye bhi note karna zaruri hota hai ki jitne door wo jayega aur jitni der wo hawa mein rahega, utni uska risk kam hota jayega kyunki wo dilute hota rahega aur uh, uski potency kam hoti jayegi. फिर हमने देखा कि एरोसल्स इसलिए एक मेजर सोर्स ऑफ डिसेमिनेशन है और वो दो सेटिंग्स में हो सकते हैं फॉर एग्जांपल नेचुरल कंडीशंस में आप बाहर हैं आपके घर पे आप घर पे हैं कोई खांस वगैरह रहा हो एंड दूसरा हेल्थ केयर या लेबोरेटरी कंडीशंस में फॉर एग्जांपल अगर आपसे कुछ गिर जाए लेबोरेटरी के अंदर या फिर कोई हेल्थ प्रोसीजर करते हुए वेंट पे किसी को डालते हुए निकालते हुए उससे काफी एरोसल जनरेशन होती है इसको नजर में रखते हुए हमने कहा कि हम इनको कंट्रोल किस तरह कर सकते हैं कंट्रोल करने के एकली टू मैकेनिज्म्स हैं एक ये कि आप पर्सनल प्रोटेक्टिव इक्विपमेंट की तरह के थ्रू करें फॉर एग्जांपल डिफरेंट टाइप ऑफ मास्क्स जो हम आगे डिस्कस करेंगे दूसरा है कि आप उसको कंटेन करें वो हो सकता है बायो सेफ्टी कैबिनेट्स के थ्रू बट ऑब्वियसली हेल्थ केयर सेटिंग्स में ये इतना वायबल ऑप्शन नहीं है एंड दूसरा हो सकता है आप नेगेटिव प्रेशर या हेपा फिल्ट्रेशन के थ्रू कर सकते हैं लेकिन मोस्ट कॉमनली जो पाकिस्तान में हम जिस तरीके से कर सकेंगे वो होगा Personal protective equipment and masks, which we will discuss in the future. Now, Dr. Ziba, your questions will be So, thank you very much. There have been several questions. I don't think they're exactly related to what we have just heard. So, let's go on with the masks because we only have 20 minutes left. We'll see how much time there is at the end. Please carry on, Dr. Philippe. Yes, actually, I see just one question which is related to, uh, to the former uh, session, but it was, it was asked privately, but I can still answer. Uh, the question is, according to, to some survey, uh, the size of COVID is heavier than other viruses. Is there still the possibility to transmit via droplets? And clearly, yes, uh, because the size of the virus is very close to the size of the influenza virus, which is also transmitted through droplets. And clearly, the size of the virus, even if it's a heavy virus, 
it's nothing when compared to to even the fine droplets and, and much more much bigger and heavier bacteria are also transmissible by droplets so clearly uh, there is no there is no doubt about that even if it's heavier than some others it is transmitted by via, via droplets okay uh, yeah So this uh, third session is about face mask. Uh, in, so the purpose is to, to present the different types of masks. Uh, we, we start with the mask that most of us know quite well, N95, but as you see on, the, on, on this picture, there are different other types of masks. I will explain a little bit more about that. Then surgical masks, which we also hear quite a lot about it. And then a cloth mask uh, that can be either homemade, do it yourself, or manufactured. And then there will be a last slide on both other masks and respirators. So, a respiratory face mask. They are clearly designed to protect the wearer from aerosol particles and droplets. It's clearly their purpose. They are made for that and they are tested for that. So, you see that there are different, uh, different types, different models of masks. Uh, and put there some some picture. They can be molded like the one on the very uh, on the left hand side. Like this one also is is molded. There are some others who have different structure. They can be without a valve like the three on the left hand side, and, or with a valve like the three on the right hand side. I will explain explain a little bit more about those valves later. Uh, and so also the the structure of the mask the uh, the composition of the mask, the materials they are made of, can be very different. There are some with cellulose, some others without cellulose, and so on. So very different models. And that, of course, has an implication with respect to disinfection. Uh, in some, some will be easier to disinfect than some others. Also, some will be more easily damaged by some treatments, while some others will be more resistant. But we'll, we'll, we'll come back on that uh, during uh, next time we, we talk. What they have in common is that uh, they need to reach some performance which are fixed by some standards and also according, uh, tested according to those standards. On these slides, I, I put a number of standards, the, the ones that are, you are the most likely to, to, to find on masks, uh, related to masks that are sold in Pakistan. So uh, those standards uh, specify the minimum efficiency level of those different masks. And you see the, on the left, uh, the American standards, European standards, Chinese standards. So in, in the US, uh, the standard defines what, what is 995 or N, uh, N99. So N95 has at least 95% efficacy. N99, nine, at least 99% efficacy. If you look in Europe, we speak about FFP2 or FFP3. It's about the same level of, of, uh, of protection. And in China, KN95, KN99 are about the same. I say about the same because the standards are not identical. Sometimes there are different parameters which are used and also the testing methods are not always the same. Just below the, the table you see, I mentioned also R95 and P95. Those masks, they have the same level of protection against aerosols as N95, but they are also resistant to oil for the first one and oil proof for the second one, meaning that even if you have projection of oil and so on, it will not penetrate the mask. Okay? The ones that are most generally recommended for high-risk situation in hospitals and medical laboratories are clearly N95 and N99 or uh, FFP2 and FFP3. So that's what is generally recommended for laboratory workers which are exposed to aerosols or hospital and uh, um, health uh, uh, staff uh, which could be exposed to, uh, to high-risk situation with respect to aerosols. One thing about uh, the, the efficacy of a first perture face mask, actually, you can only reach uh, performance which are close to the tested performance only if the masks are worn properly and also if they are well adjusted to the face. So the fitting of the mask is very important. So uh, in relation to this, it's important to choose a, a suitable model 
and also for large institutions and so on, or uh, you might want to have different models if this is possible, just because not everybody has the same shape of, of face, I would say. Some basic training is also uh, needed to at least to, to know how to put it on cor correctly and also how to take it off correctly without uh, risking to, uh, to infect ourselves. And then the last one is fit testing. Fit testing is at least recommended when wearing such masks. And like in many American institutions, it's mandatory to have some fit testing. And this is something I want to point out because uh, fitting is not optimal and sometimes very poor in presence of a, a period, for instance. And I know that in, in Pakistan, as in many Muslim countries, many men wear a beard. That means that it's the, their protection might be compromised because of that. And of course, uh, it, it's it, it's not so e obvious in, in Muslim countries to to convince males not to, to wear a beard just because they need to, to wear a mask for, for some of their activities. So it can be an issue like uh, in a country like, like, like yours. The second point I want to stress on is uh, that valve that uh, that is present on some FF, uh, N95 and 99 masks. Actually, the purpose of that uh, that valve is to facilitate exhaling, so breathing out. It, it's much more comfortable from that point of view. Also, it reduces the the moisture inside inside of the mask. If you work in a very hot environment, if you have a physical work uh, exposed to dust and so on, in that case, you might be sweating, and the uh, the presence of the valve will will make it more comfortable in that respect. However, uh, that valve has a major drawback. It, it's that there is no filtration of the 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 air which is uh, which is exhaled by the wearers it means that if the, the person who wears the mask is infected, in that case, the air that is breathing out uh, will be infected and it will not be filtered. It will go through that valve. So that means clearly that uh, there is no protection of the colleagues and patients if the wearer is infected. So two conclusions to this. The first one is that only respiratory mask without a valve offer two-way protection. Two-way protection meaning for the wearer, but also for the people who are around that person. And the second conclusion is that in the COVID context, valved masks should not be worn in a healthcare setting. If a valve mask is worn in that, in that case, and if the healthcare worker who is wearing that is infected, in that case, it will contribute to the uh, dissemination of the virus. Surgical masks now, they are totally different. And actually, these are designed to arrest bodily fluids from the wearer. So they are not made to protect the wearer, but to protect the person who is in front of the wearer. Uh, it was mainly developed for surgical situations where, of course, we don't want the nurses and the surgeon and so on to have some, some of their fluids uh, infecting the patient. Uh, in general, they have three layers, and the uh, filtering layer is inside two, uh, two layers of fabric. There is no need for a uh, tight face fit. Why? Because ex exhalation of, of the air is through mouth and nose, and as long as the no mouth and nose are well covered, there is no risk of, of not, not much risk of, of disseminating uh, an aerosol. It will be stopped immediately. Um, also, in general, there is no safety rating. There are some standards, but it's not uh, it's not so strict, and it's not really a safety rating. And there is no claim protection of the person who wears the mask. As a consequence, uh, surgical masks are not considered personal protective equipment, meaning, for instance, that in the industry or in a in a setting where there are some regulations that uh, say that the employer must provide some personal protective equipment to the employees. In that case, they are cannot be provided because they are not considered as personal protective equipment. In a COVID context, that means that it's mostly recommended for COVID patients. And should normally not, it's not recommended that, uh, that the uh, healthcare people, laboratory people wear that for their own protection. That's the, the official recommendation. Still, I want to present you this kind of, of study. Actually, 
this comes from uh, from one of the first studies uh, that was done on, on this uh, on the comparison between a surgical mask with a 95 and 99 mask and in that case it was done before the covid outbreak but there are a few new studies that have been done in, in, in between actually um, in, uh, these studies they do not it's not a testing of the mask like we would do in a laboratory it's more like a field study like a clinical study i would say and in this study uh, 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 2800 and more nurses in from seven u.s medical centers were divided in two groups and each of the group were assigned either a 995 and 95 or a surgical mask okay and the study uh, was conducted during four years and the, the way to measure the efficacy of the mask was to measure the incidence of uh, flu disease. Uh, it's, it can be extrapolated to SARS because uh, the two virus have, uh, have, have very similar sizes. Anyway, if we look at the, at the, at the graph, we see that uh, only 8.2% of the people who are wearing uh, um, um, uh, N95 masks uh, were infected uh, uh, by the flu virus, while 7.2 were uh, were protected. Sorry, were protected when wearing a surgical mask. So the difference between the two is is not so much, and it's certainly not significant from a statistic point of view. So this tends to show that perhaps surgical masks also offer some protection, and it's probably the case. Is it a good protection or not? Uh, it's probably not the best protection. Uh, indeed, we need to be very careful with this kind of studies, and it's also the case for the more recent ones that have been done. First, those people, those nurses, were wearing the mask at work, and not, of course, during their uh, normal life. And so most of the people who got infected by flu were infected not at work, but during their more normal life, from their family, from their contacts in, the, in society, and so on. So uh, it does not really measure the exposure at, at work. So if we were only measuring the exposure at work, I guess that the difference between the two types of masks would probably be higher. A second factor that might also uh, make us more cautious about that is that people were wearing a surgical mask because they, are, they, they kind of know that they are less protected. Perhaps at work they were taking more precautions and avoid more direct exposure. So there are a number of reasons which make this kind of study not totally, uh, we, we still have questions about those studies. Still, I think that the difference is very low. And, and, and still, I think that uh, we think uh, that surgical masks, even there, if they are not made to protect the wearer, they still bring some significant uh, personal protection. How much, that's something we don't know. I say this because in some cases, we really don't have any 90, N95 masks or anything like that. And in that case, it's certainly better to wear a good surgical mask than uh, nothing. Third type of mask, the cloth masks, uh, there are many different types. Uh, and of course, uh, one reason for that is that there is no standard, there is no specification and no performance standard that exists. They can be homemade, but, but more and more are manufactured by different cloth industries. They don't have any defined or demonstrated protection. We cannot say that this mask protects at 75% and this other are 95%. We don't have any idea of that. There are huge differences in design, but also in the materials. Uh, and so, obviously, they're, 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 it's likely that there are major differences in the effective protection. If you look, look at the different picture, pictures, the third one, the light blue one, you see this type of mask looks, looks a little bit like a surgical mask. It's also three layer, but you can, you see it's open for the moment, but you can put some filter inside. By many specialists consider that this type of mask is probably uh, the most protective one uh, because you can put some good type of of, uh, of fabric inside or even some uh, filtering paper and so on that you can uh, remove when you have to replace it. So uh, there is a trend to uh, to favor this type of mask. 
by some of, of some specialists, I would say. Then my last slide about other types of masks and respirators. Uh, the two uh, on the left hand side are uh, half face and full face respirator. The main difference is that the full face also has a, a, a face shield, so the eyes are uh, the, the whole face is, is covered. They work with uh, cartridges. Uh, there, there should be one here. It's not on for the moment. And of course, those cartridges they, they might have different filters. So in general, those filters, those masks, those respirators are used to protect from a number of chemicals. But if you have HEPA filters among those filters, in that case, they will also uh, protect from uh, infectious aerosols. And in that case, the filter you need is P3. So in that case, they are also good for uh, biological protection, I would say. The two uh, on the left, uh, right hand side are what we call uh, powered air purifying respirators, PAPR. This one is half phase, the second one is full phase. Those have been uh, specifically designed for uh, laboratory or uh, biosafety, bio uh, I would say, for laboratory activities or uh, healthcare situations. Um, the main feature is that it's ventilated actively, but there is a HEPA filter, and the HEPA filter will retain uh, the aerosol uh, particles. Actually, first, those type of masks are usually not worn in, in front of, of patients or even for laboratory activities. It's only for very high risk laboratory activities that they can be worn when there is no other means. They are very comfortable, especially the paper masks. Uh, they are very uh, uh, very comfortable but they are expensive and also not readily available for most labs and, and hospitals in Pakistan so we won't speak more uh, much more about this we'll focus more on the other types of masks and this was my last slide so Michelle. So in this presentation, we have seen different types of masks. We have seen that there are respirators, N95, which we call surgical masks are available, and cloth masks, which are also manufactured, and other kinds of respirators. We have seen that there are different types of N95, which are molded with your mouth, and generally, they provide more protection with your mouth, and generally, they provide more protection with your mouth. Their standards are different, although. स्टैंडर्ड्स की जब हम बात करते हैं तो हम देखते हैं फॉर एग्जांपल एन 95 जो है इट वाज उसके सेम इक्विवेलेंट अवेलेबल होगा यूरोप के अंदर चाइना के अंदर न्यूजीलैंड और ऑस्ट्रेलिया के अंदर डिफरेंट नाम से इक्विवेलेंस कंप्लीटली सेम नहीं होती है डिफरेंट टेस्टिंग मेथड्स होते हैं हर अपने उसके लेकिन जनरली वो सेम लेवल ऑफ प्रोटेक्शन प्रोवाइड करते हैं और हमने देखा कि हेल्थ के सेटिंग्स के अंदर एन 95 या एन 99 सबसे ज्यादा रिकमेंडेड है हमने फिर देखा कि इनकी परफॉर्मेंस एंड फिटिंग किन चीजों से इफेक्ट हो सकती है अगर हमने इस मास में प्रॉपर तरीके से काम करना है तो फिर जरूरी है कि इसको सही तरीके से पहना जाए और इसकी फिटिंग जो है आपके मुंह पे प्रॉपरली प्रॉपरली हुई हो ये कुछ कंट्रीज में फॉर एग्जांपल मुस्लिम कंट्रीज में यहाँ पे दाढ़ियों वगैरह का ज्यादा रवाज है उधर मसला हो सकता है कि वहां पे फिटिंग का इशू हो सकता है जिसपे ओवरऑल मास्क की एफिकेसी कम हो जाती है हमने फिर थोड़ी सी रेस्पिरेटर्स की बात की जिनके ऊपर वायल्स हैं वायल्स का जो बेस बेस सबसे इम्पोर्टेंट फीचर जिस वजह से वहाँ पे इन्हें रखा होता है वो कंफर्ट के लिए जो बंदा जिस बंदे ने मास्क पहना वो वो बाहर सांस ले सके लेकिन इसका एक नुकसान ये है कि इसके अंदर जो प्रोटेक्शन है सिर्फ वन वे होती है फॉर एग्जांपल अगर आप बाहर सांस ले रहे हैं तो फिल्टर जो है वो बाहर की तरफ नहीं होता इसके अंदर जो फिल्टर है वो सिर्फ वन वे है इसलिए ये हेल्थ केयर सेटिंग्स के अंदर अवॉइड करने को कहा जा रहा है हमने फिर सर्जिकल मास्क की बात की सर्जिकल मास्क जनरली थ्री लेयर्ड मास्क होते हैं ये लूज फिटिंग होते हैं एंड उनको वैसे पीपी इस वजह से कंसीडर नहीं किया जाता लेकिन ये पार्टिकल्स वगैरह कैप्चर कर सकते हैं तो इसलिए कोविड पेशेंट्स के अंदर इन मास्क को हम रिकमेंड कर रहे हैं फिर हमने थोड़ी सी एक स्टडी डिस्कस की स्टडी के अंदर हमने देखा था कि एक ग्रुप ऑफ नर्सेस था जिनको एन मिला था और एक था जिनको सर्जिकल मास्क मिला था और उन दोनों में डिफरेंसेस जब आए थे रेट ऑफ इन्फेक्शन के वो बहुत वन परसेंट का सिर्फ डिफरेंस था जो स्टेटिस्टिकली सिग्निफिकेंट नहीं है लेकिन इस स्टडी को हम जब भी सामने देखे हमने ये जरूर देखना है कि और फीच और फैक्टर्स भी हो सकते हैं जिसने स्टडी को इन्फेक्ट किया हो फॉर एग्जाम्पल वो इन्फेक्शन हॉस्पिटल से नहीं ले रहे थे बाहर से उनको इन्फ्लुएंजा की इन्फेक्शन हो रही थी या फिर जो लोगों ने सर्जिकल 
मास्क पहने हुए थे वो वैसे ज्यादा केयरफुल हो रहे थे हैंड वॉशिंग वगैरह और उसमें लेकिन एट द सेम टाइम इन केसेस जहां पे एन रेडिली अवेलेबल नहीं है सर्जिकल मास्क पहनने का भी फायदा हो सकता है हमने लास्ट फिर हमने देखा क्लॉथ मास्क के बारे में क्लॉथ मास्क का सबसे बड़ा मसला ये है कि इसके अंदर कोई स्टैंडर्डाइजेशन नहीं है लोग घर में भी बना सकते हैं बाहर भी बना सकते हैं अगर क्लॉथ मास्क से देखा जाए तो फिर हमने कहा था कि जो थर्ड इसमें थर्ड फोटो में जो क्लॉथ मास्क है जिसके अंदर एक फिल्टर प्रेजेंट है ये फिर भी कोई सिग्निफिकेंट प्रोटेक्शन प्रोवाइड कर सकता है हमने फिर जो मास्क देखे वो थे रेस्पिरेटर्स फॉर एग्जांपल पेपर्स या फिर फुल फेस रेस्पिरेटर्स इनका uh, ज्यादा हम डिस्कस नहीं करेंगे क्योंकि ये पाकिस्तान में रेडिली अवेलेबल नहीं है इनका एक नुकसान ये होता है कि ये बहुत एक्सपेंसिव होते हैं तो हम इनको ज्यादा डिस्कस नहीं करेंगे uh, अब हम आपके क्वेश्चन की तरफ आ जाते हैं डॉक्टर जीबा आप ये सेशन विल यू मॉडरेट देशन यस Uh, there's been a huge number of questions, and I know that it's already six o'clock in the evening in Pakistan. For those of you who want to stay for a few minutes, we could take a couple of questions. Otherwise, we will pick these questions up when we do the session on uh, it. I think we're going to change it to Tuesday of next week instead of Monday. Uh, and also, uh, Pepsa will be putting this presentation up on their YouTube channel. So if any of your friends would like to attend, it would be much better if they heard the basic session before they come to the question and answer session. So Philippe, do you want to take any questions now? There are many of them. Yeah, I, I, um, thank you very much for all those questions. I'm uh, very pleased to see all those questions. Uh, and there are some some very, very smart and interesting ones. So I, I, I propose that we indeed discuss that together next time. There is one so one gentleman who proposed to to send me some inf to send to share some information. Uh, of course, you can do that in the meantime. It can only feed the discussion for next time. Perhaps the only question I will answer right now is someone who is asking a question about the exhaling valve. Is it filtering or not? Clearly not, and that's the re reason why uh, those masks with a, a exhaling valve do not protect the, the surrounding, the people uh, who are not wearing a mask. So clearly, that exhaling valve is is something which closes when we inhale, but which opens when we uh, breathe out. So there is no no filtration at that level. Okay. So I propose that we now have a look at the last uh, the last slide, if it comes. Yeah, it's about the next uh, session. So probably next Tuesday. So first, we we'll, of course we'll we'll take all the questions that have been uh, asked now and, and try to manage uh, to answer those questions. If you have other major questions that you want uh, to to ask, please send them to Pepsi office. So, uh, in that case, please send those questions to the PEPSA office at those two addresses there. Then the proposed topics for discussion, we try to sort the questions, we put them into those, those different topics. Uh, that These are proposals, so we can always come with some, some other issues. But the main topic that we wanted to address is uh, the shortage issue. So, there, are, there is a lack of good protective mask. And so, we we'll look at the alternatives to N95 and, and similar masks. We we'll also use, uh, look at the possibility to, to reuse masks or uh, possibly to use them longer than initially planned for the type of mask. We'll also discuss about mask contamination in order to be able to reuse them and then also uh, discuss about the interest and, and, and protection that we can gain from uh, do-it-yourself or other cloth mask. Also, we can discuss about the management of mask use and supplies, uh, for instance, in an organization, in a region and so on, to be sure that the right mask uh, uh, go to the right persons. Uh, one aspect that we might discuss also is uh, suboptimal quality of some masks and possible counterfeit masks. I mentioned that because we had some, uh, some issues with that in, in, in Belgium and in Europe. Masks that were not that we are similar to official masks with the markings and so on, and some reference to standards, but they were not uh, protective or not protective enough. 
And of course, any other questions you would have related to masks, please feel free to, uh, to, to, to send them and, and to ask them. Any comments, uh, suggestions about this? Uh, Michelle, are you going to go ahead and translate? Yes, I was just waiting if there were any questions. So, uh, thank you everyone. Aapne aaj ka session liya. Agla session hamara hoga Tuesday ko. Agar aap kisi ko jante hain jinhone ye session attend nahi kiya aur wo wo wala session karna chahte hain, unko bolein please ye video dekh le. Ye hamare YouTube pe kuch time mein upload ho jayegi. Agle session mein hum primarily aapke sare question and answers pe focus karenge. Aap logon ne aaj jo questions ki hain aur jo answer nahi hoye, hum unko dekhenge. Uske alawa hum thode se aur detail mein jayenge ki hum mask ko reuse kis tarah kar sakte hain. Usko डिकंटामिनेट और डिसइंफेक्ट किस तरह कर सकते हैं और फिर हम थोड़ी सी डिस्कशन करेंगे काउंटरफिट मास्क में जो मार्केट में फेक मास्क अवेलेबल हैं उनको हम किस तरह प्रिवेंट कर सकते हैं और उनको यूज ना करें अगर आपके पास कोई क्वेश्चंस हैं जो आपको लेट्स से कल या परसों ख्याल आता है आप पहले से हमें ईमेल कर सकते हैं फिलिप कैन यू प्लीज गो बैक ऑन द लास्ट स्लाइड ईमेल एड्रेस इस वक्त आपके स्क्रीन पे होगा मुझे या आप शुरू को ईमेल कर दें अपने जोन से भी क्वेश्चंस हैं ताकि हम पहले उनको प्रिपेयर करते हैं अगले सेशन में हम उनको भी डिस्कस कर सकेंगे थैंक यू अगेन सब अटेंड करने के लिए एंड मेरी तरफ से खुदा हाफिज Thank you, everybody. I uh, really appreciate your staying on even late into the day, and we look forward to your additional questions and to another session. Tuesday at the same time, 5 p.m. Pakistan time. And uh, that's all for now. Thank you, Dr. Philippe. Thank you, Dr. Michelle. Dafis. Thank you, everyone, for your participation.